I was born on a farm away south of here almost 90 years ago. Sometimes it feels like a hundred years, sometimes just last week. I'm a fruit farmer. God puts the fruit in the trees, I get it to the people. I take a lot of pictures, helps me see longer, helps me hold on to things that would rather be getting on their way. As my daddy bought me my first camera, told me it was a time machine. I seen him cry over a photograph or two, a photo of his mama, one of his brother died when he was little. I met my Hattie when we were both 15. Had to wait a few years more to get married. She was a soft creature. Used to fit right up under my arm if we were both standing without shoes on. And she'd look up at me in that way that was hers. <laughs> Every day until the day she died. She gave me three good kids. The boys strong, and the girls were sweet like her. Never had much to speak of in the way of money, but I never felt poor. I always felt like God gave me more than I knew what to do with. I got this house and the farm. I got my eyes to see the trees put on their best colors in the fall. I got these legs that move me over my land. I got these arms that can still remember the heft of my babies. These hands that know soft and rough. My ears still hear the music that put the shivers under my hair and down my back. My heart still bumps inside me, talks to my God, tells him my troubles, thanks him for what he gave me. I don't know what else to be but grateful. Honest, I just don't. What's up everybody? Welcome to church on Sunday. <laughs> All right, let's do this real quick because we got people watching literally everywhere. We have five times as many people watching online this week, go figure, as we have in the building. So let's give it up for so many people. I was actually just texting my mom backstage. Uh, first off, our Greensboro family, give it up for Greensboro this morning, everybody. Hey, Greensboro, can you do me a favor? Because y'all had a lot of people at church last week. Can you give it up for everybody here? We need all the encouragement we can get. They're like, yeah, I don't know why y'all are clapping, but that's okay. Um, North Carolina, uh, Greensboro, Wisconsin, Nevada, New Jersey, Illinois, Kentucky. Hello, Lisa in Michigan, Craig and Rosanna in Florida, Iowa, Ohio, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Billy and Diane in Alabama, Minnesota, California, Maine, and also Neil. What's going on? You're watching from the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, Iraq this morning. Give it up for everybody. I, don't, I think it's last night, tonight. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to James. We're going to be um, all over the place, but we're going to start there this morning. Guys, thanks for coming to church. I really do appreciate, appreciate you being here. We're going to talk a little bit about the things that have happened. We're going to close down the domino effect series with an idea that we had really from the beginning. And because of last week and us having to go online, I didn't really unpack the way I wanted to. So I've got an extra weekend. Let's do it. Next week. We start Christmas. Thank God. We need some Christmas. I'll say good news. You say it's Christmas. Good news. It's Christmas. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Um, I, I hope Tracy told you to hold your communication card. I want you to get it out. If you're online, uh, you can go on our online communication card. Greensboro, help us out as well. I want to see these um, ideas, these moments. Here's what I'm going to ask you, and I wrote it this way, and it's probably not the right way to say it because I know what you're going to write down, but I, want to, I need your help. Um, write down what thought is really dominant in your mind as you head into Christmas this year. What are you thinking about? And I know what most of you are going to write, right? 
COVID. I, I get that. You, you can write that if you want to, but what is, this is a different year. Do you realize a year ago, this week, we were in week two of an epic Christmas series that we journeyed to Israel. We were like oozing people out that we couldn't get people in the building week after week after week. Look around. Whoa, what a difference a year makes. I mean, look around. It's crazy to think that was a year ago. And so this year is a different year. Walking into Christmas, I don't care how many Hallmark movies you watch. I watched two last week. Two is all I could get through. The same two thoughts. Country singer meets up with some. It's just some of y'all watched it, right? That, I, I couldn't take anymore. But I'm trying to get in the spirit of Christmas. But I am transporting myself to 2019, Brent. And how awesome and excited I was to share with you this epic journey as we followed in the footsteps of Christ, especially Nazareth and Bethlehem. And it was just so epic and it was so awesome and we couldn't get enough of it. And it was one of the great Christmas highlights of our church this last decade. And now we come into 2020 and I wonder, where's the steam coming from? I think we are, and guys, listen to me. I know some of you are like, well, Brent, I mean, look around the room. You caused this. You got COVID, and now we're all scared to death because we thought, I mean, good Lord, I mean, Brent, you're close to God, and you got it. And then some of you are like, I don't think so. I think Pastor Pat is close to God, and she got it, so that's why. But listen, I mean, we cannot be a church. We cannot be a person that we're just all going to wait for the other shoe to drop our entire lives. And that's where we're living, y'all. If you look around the room this morning and, I, and I'm, I'm fired up, you're like, well, Brent, you seem like you feel better. Yeah, I got COVID. I, I recovered. I had the flu in waves. I lost my taste and smell for two days. I ate Outback Alice Springs chicken one night and couldn't taste the bacon and mushrooms, Gary. I mean, oh, oh, Lord. The world came to an end for me, but the next day I could taste the honey mustard and life was good. My mom, who's watching, and by the way, some of you are like, how's Pastor Pat doing? I had to beg my mom not to come to church today. Begged her. I told her the other day, you're not coming. She's like, you're not going to tell me. Well, you know my mom, right? So she'll more than likely be back. I think she's chatting on one of the platforms this morning. She was last night, and um, she's, she's doing great. And there's, there, there is a real virus. I've said it all along, but yet, boy, we have sure, because of media and social media, we have fallen off the deep end. We are all about the negative. We're all about kind of accepting darkness and not reflecting light. And you're like, well, Brent, that's not true. Yeah, it is. I'll say this, and I don't want to throw you under the bus because I love everybody watching in. Lean in, but I'm going to give you a pass this week. Next week, as we jump into Christmas, especially families, you're my age, you're, you're, you're younger than me, and we have a ton of them in our church, um, and you're going to Sit it out, waiting for the other shoe to drop and allow your children not to have the innocence of Christmas and allow them to practice next week and then the week after that, sing on the platform to allow us all to have that Christmas moment. I, mean, I look at the average age of what's, who's sitting in the seats this morning here at our Sevierville campus, and it's a lot older than me. And I just wonder where we are when it comes to this idea of time, this idea of mitigating our moments, that we think somehow we can mitigate things that are happening in our lives. And we can say, well, I can control this variable. You're like, well, Brent, we can't come to church. I mean, we'll spread the virus. Listen, we have spread the seats out. We're doing the best we can. We as a church have been navigating this for a long time. And I know I caused this. And it was my fault. I'll take the blame. It was a week ago Wednesday. Um, Pastor Pat wasn't feeling well. I had gotten back from out of town with my son. I'll close with that in a moment again. And I wasn't feeling the greatest. And we had several staff members that weren't feeling well. And so we ended up testing the staff again. We're getting used to it now. The staff has tested more than anybody I know. And uh, all of a sudden I found out at 1 o'clock Wednesday on November the 18th, it was a week ago Wednesday, that I had tested positive, and we had several, Giovanna had tested positive, we had several that tested positive for COVID, and so we got blindsided. We had no other choice than to uh, just say we have to jump online this week at church. I said that even months ago. If you go back and listen to what I said, because I've watched, rewatched 
making sure that I'm very consistent with my message that, hey, there might be a moment that we have to run online. And we had to last week just because it was my fault. I didn't set up a protocol. We'll use the right words around here. Set up a protocol to make sure that church moved forward. We just had too many staff members that were either exposed or had tested positive. All of them are better. Even Pastor Pat, she's on the men. She should be back next week. Uh, So we just had to to close church. And I knew as soon as I made that decision what was going to happen. People are going to go, well, see, I tried, and that's, listen, the bottom line is we have to be people of faith. We have to be. And uh, um, if if any more, I guess I'm immune for a while. I said last night, and this is the world we live in. How do you even navigate this world as a pastor? Well, I'm immune now. I guess I can, you know, lick doorknobs for at least a few weeks and then uh, hang out in Newport if I want to. I mean, I I guess, right? I I shouldn't say that. um, Somebody tech email me right away and goes, well, you're not, you, we don't know. You might, you might be able to get it again tomorrow. And I'm like, well, you know what? More than likely, I'll, re- I'll recover again in a few days. I mean, I sat around. I felt good four or five days ago. I was about to chew bark off trees because here I'm sitting around because I, I, I have the plague, right? I can't, I can't go anywhere. I'm quarantined. And yet it's just, it's, it's just insane today to think about the world in which we live, that we have to battle these battles and we have to fight these fights. And yet we're not guaranteed another day. And we don't get it, right? We don't see it. We don't highlight it as Christians that, have you see CBS News yesterday in Japan? More people killed themselves in the month of October than the entire, um, entire pandemic in Japan. More people killed themselves in October than the people that died in the entire pandemic in Japan since last March. No one talks about that. We don't talk about our mental health. We don't talk about the state of depression and all of us embracing darkness. You're like, no, we don't. Sure we do. Most of us, you know how we navigate our day anymore? We get up and we go on the Sevier County Health Department website and see how many cases. Oh, Lord, it went up again. How many people do that? Raise your hand high. Nobody's going to raise their hand, but it's just me as the pastor. I'm like, oh boy, because if cases go, I know what's going to happen. And and in our lives, I'm just telling you, the greatest domino effect illustration I can give you to close this series, and I missed it last week because I just wanted to roll with Philippians last week, the greatest domino effect is time. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, build a lifetime. And we know that, right? The small things, the seconds, the minutes, the hours add up. Pretty soon years go by. And then it seems like your life has passed you by, slipped on by. And yet what I hear today, and I've heard it from lots of people. Hey, Brent, I'm not going to come back to church for a long time. Hadn't been here in a long time. Won't be back till a vaccine Guys, we have a flu vaccine. We have that flu shot, and it doesn't necessarily take the flu away. Um, Our spiritual rhythms and our spiritual life are so important. And if we sit around and just wait and let life slip on by, we're not guaranteed another minute. You're like, well, Brent, I don't agree with you. You should be kinder and gentler this week. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says this in James chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow, we will go do this or go to that city or spend a year here or carry on business or make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So how do I want to start this week? This week, I want to start the way I was going to close the series down last week before we had to kind of preempt one week. And I was going to talk about time. Because I do believe it, and I think all of us will. Let's all watch it together one more time just for me. I love doing this. Seconds, minutes, hours, months, weeks, years. They create a lifetime, and before we know it, our lifetime is over. Aren't you excited and encouraged? You're like, thanks, I got out for this. The question in life, the question that we should never ask ourselves is this question. I've preached it before, and I'll go back to it. You're like, Brent, this is super morbid. For this week in particular, the question is not, how do we avoid death? But come on, church, that's the question that we ask every day. We get up, how do I avoid possibly dying? 
because that's what the media has told us. I mean, our media, even in East Tennessee, Greensboro, you, I mean, we're buckle of the Bible belt. We're conservative. We've talked about all that. We're, we're definitely a little bit laxer. Some of you have been here when it comes to rules and regulations and all that. Our own media basically out and out tells us, don't go to church, don't go out, but have any, is anybody driven in town lately? Anybody try to get into Tanger parking lot lately? I mean, it's everywhere. So now what's happened? Well, you don't hear of it spreading in gatherings. You hear it spreading in cars and in around Thanksgiving tables and just hanging out. How did my mom get it? She went out to uh, eat with friends. Apparently they had masks on. They sat down at the table. You're not going to wear a mask when you eat. They had a great time together and they got it either at that table or, or riding in a car. How did I get it? I hugged my mom. Or um, my son-in-law, Houston, had it. He lost his taste. Old to be 20, right? 26 years old. He lost his taste and smell for a while. He was devastated because he couldn't taste Cancun, pollo con queso. I mean, (laughs) but I think I rode in a golf cart with him. And somehow, because I'm a hugger, and that's my son-in-law, and I'm hugging on him and loving on him because his golf game that day was awful, and I was trying to encourage. That's probably how I got it. What in a church? A lot of our staff, we can contact trace where we got it, whether it was Austin hugging grandpa, hanging out with his grandparents. We, there's just such innocent ways to do this. It's all around us. And yet so many of us today, we're listening to what the world tells us. And the world, let me tell you, speculates like crazy. We have no idea what to think, what to believe. We're way beyond that now. Now it's just don't go to thank. Now, last week, don't go to Thanksgiving. And now guess what I'm hearing? I've already heard it. I knew I was going to hear it. And this is what concerns me the most. Because Christmas is a springboard into a new year. Man, we need the manger. We need good news. We need nostalgia. We need moments of, hey, let's let's celebrate joy to the world. We need it. I I believe we need a heavy dose, one, one service of Christmas fun with Brent and Gus. We need it, but yet, you know what I've already heard? I'm not going to come to church at all the next couple weeks because I know Christmas is coming. And boy, I don't want to get it before I get to Christmas time. If that's not waiting for the other shoe to drop, if that's not trying to mitigate your life, thinking, well, I can control what I can control, you are not guaranteed one more day. Why don't we understand that? The question should be always this, how do I avoid not having lived? My mother, my mom and I have had some interesting conversations about both of us getting COVID and mom having to actually go to the hospital. And there's a lot of spiritual analogy to me to what took place. Mom had sat home for several days and just wasn't getting any better um, my sister and I, and along with our, our, our family doctor, Dr. Justice, we decided to be proactive and say, you know what, mom, you're dehydrated. You need to get some fluids. Let's check your oxygen levels, all of that. And so she went to LeCant. They took incredible care of her. I mean, incredible care of her. We have people that work in LeCant that go to the church. And even though we couldn't go into the hospital, we were getting texts real time and, and how mom is a charger. Mom literally won two people to Jesus in the hospital. Does that even... And so here's the spiritual analogy. You know what? If mom would have sat home and just said, I'll just sit here and try to deal with this on my own, day after day after day, and that would have turned into weeks, there was a big chance we would have had a major problem. But yet we got proactive, and mom actually had to take a step of action and go to the hospital. And you know what I'm going to say to all of us? If you sit home week after week, month after month, and you think, well, spiritually I'm going to be okay, what is the church called? It is not a museum for the saint. It is a hospital for the sinner. And there might be moments where we got to come and say, wait a minute, spiritually... I can get spiritual pneumonia if I don't watch it, and there's not a lot of oxygen for me to breathe. 
We have to come and be encouraged. The steps of faith that God has mandated in his word are beyond the sermon, beyond the music. It is to get out of what we're doing and just not necessarily follow the path of least resistance. And some of you at home, you're like, well, Brent, I can't believe you're picking on me. I'm at home because you got it. Listen, I'll give you a pass this week, but if you know you need to be here and you are healthy and you're younger than me and your kids are involved and you've got lots of things on the line, Don't sit it out because I'm telling you now that is not the right thing to do. I don't care who tells you that. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you cannot let your life slip on by thinking, well, I'll just wait for six months down the road when everything will be better. It won't be. Man, spiritual rhythm is important. I literally about went crazy just one week out of this building with you guys. And I'm thinking to myself, I almost felt like a state of depression. Like I need to be here with you. I spoke a week ago Wednesday. There was nobody in the building but Mike and Ryan on the camera because I was positive. I had the plague, and I wanted to preach a message, and I preached here, and that was the only people in the building. Gus had to come up and play piano right there. So guess what? I was 30 feet from Gus, but after we got Gus tested just in case, He was fine, but that's just how it is. People are like, Brian, I can't get around you. And it's so interesting to me, the world in which we live. And I know I have an edge about me and I I, I, I wanna battle for gratitude today because I used to think we could just look around. I mean, I love the video you just saw. Think of that, that older man, just his life and what he went through and yet he chose to be happy. Gratitude, giving thanks is how happy people live. There's not a lot of that today. We don't have a lot of gratitude. You can feel it. You can sense it in the the world and we live. I can sense it in our church. I can't believe where we find ourselves. And just this idea of numbness, this idea of I gotta gotta sit around and I gotta wait for the other shoe to drop. And I I equated it this way and I mentioned it just a week ago, but I didn't get a chance to unpack it. And I wanna unpack it for a minute. Um, How do we value our time? It'll come on the screen. That is such a huge thing today, valuing our time. And we have to be careful how to value our time. And so I I said it uh, last week's message, but I wanna unpack it for a minute. We either can reject darkness and reflect light. That's, what, that's how we value time. We reject darkness and we reflect light. Go back, um, Murray, I think you're running it up there. Go back to rejecting darkness if you can. There's one other possibility, right? Accepting darkness or rejecting darkness. And I'm not talking about like evil sin here. I'm not talking about, well, I'm going to live in the cesspool of the world and I'm going to do crazy things. Darkness, there's another connotation, right? And that's discouragement. That's depression, that's despair. We have to reject that. We have to be people of faith and go, wait a minute, I don't want my life to slip on by. I'm not guaranteed another moment. And how do I really live? Man, I fuel up my spiritual life. I reject darkness. I reject depression. I mean, giving thanks is how happy people live. I love the premise of that video. That is a decision that we have to make. It is not like, well, circumstances will wash over me and then I'll be happy. We have to decide. We have to battle for it more than ever. And I just believe in that. How do we value our time, especially as we walk into Christmas? And this is really a setup to walk into the rest of this season, the rest of 2020, is we have to reject darkness we can't accept it. We can't just go, well, I'm just going to wait for the other shoe to drop. That's what, that's what really accepting darkness looks like. Well, I'm just going to sit down in my house and I'm just going to sit here. I don't know what's real. I don't know what to think about. I mean, I, I don't know. And so I'm telling you now, you can only watch so many Hallmark movies. Because there's no way you can accept darkness and accept defeat and discouragement and depression and reflect light. I just preached it. I know it feels like 10 years ago, but in this domino effect series, the Apostle Paul, the church of Thessalonica, what is he basically saying when he's encouraging the church there, even in persecution? He says what? Discouraged people, discourage people, and encouraged people, encourage people. 
And encouragement has to be done together, has to be done under God's banner. Interesting study, 300 young adults. This is how I was going to close this series down. They did a study a, a while ago with 300 young adults when it comes to the word gratitude. I know we're coming off Thanksgiving, and I wanted to close the domino effect series down because I really do believe the greatest domino effect analogy is time. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years turn into a lifetime. Talking about a chain reaction. So they did this study. They took three groups of 300 young adults. They put them in three groups, 100, 100 each. One group wrote a letter of gratitude each week for three weeks. They were instructed, you need to sit down and write a letter, and this letter has to be filled with gratitude. Nothing negative can be in this letter. So a hundred of them, for three weeks, they just wrote letters of gratitude. A hundred of them wrote about their deepest thoughts and feelings, but they said, here's what we want you to do. We want you to share your deepest thoughts and feelings on paper, and we want you to tell all of your negative experiences. Everything negative. And then the other group, guess what they got to do? Nothing. They did no writing. You're like, I want to be in that group. Nothing. They just sat there. They didn't do anything. They just numbed out. So here's what they found. This is fascinating to me. I love this. They found out this about gratitude in this study of 300 adults or 300 young people. Group number one, write it down and just think about it as you walk into Christmas. Gratitude unshackles us from toxic emotions. They found out that these hundred that wrote all of these positive, grateful things, they discovered a greater increase of mental health, a greater attention to appreciation, and it unshackled them from toxic emotions. Some of you are like, well, Brent, we know that. Number two, gratitude helped even if they didn't share it. That's interesting. They didn't have to send the letter to grandma or send a letter to a friend. Gratitude, just writing about gratitude, journaling, really, hey, how grateful they were, really affected them. They didn't even have to share it. Three, gratitude's, uh, gratitude's benefits take time, and that's an interesting thing that we don't think about. They wrote a letter, that one group, one letter a week for the first three weeks, and they found out this is interesting. They found out that the mental benefit of what they did, that exercise, increased in their minds week four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. That gratitude takes time. The benefits take time. That it doesn't just happen. Some of us are so depleted when it comes to our spiritual lives and our great gratitude lives that, you know what, we need to begin to build that up. We don't want to sit there and accept darkness, we want to reflect light. And lastly, it goes with, the, goes with that third one. Gratitude had lasting effects on the brain. Last week, I mentioned it. I'll throw him back up there for two seconds. Michael J. Fox, I read that um, article and I mentioned it in last week's message. But if you didn't get a chance to, to listen to last week's message or I didn't make any sense last week because I was kind of levitating up here, I, I, I was doing the best I could. Uh, very interesting that a guy with Parkinson's, first off, not a Christian that I know of, a guy with Parkinson's, a guy that had a spinal tumor, a guy because of Parkinson's fell on his kitchen floor and shattered his left arm completely. His bone was exposed. Would really be the poster boy. What is wrong with us as Christians that Michael J. Fox would be the poster boy that said, you know what, my optimism in life is always led by my gratitude. I'm just grateful for the life that I've lived. Somebody that had it all and now is struggling to even communicate and talk. If you listen, I, and I've been listening to his audio book, um, something about the future starts now. It's a nice little spin on Back to the Future. Uh, he's ba basically, you can hear optimism in a um, middle-aged man's voice that has Parkinson's. That, yeah, he's had money. Yeah, they've tried everything they can. But yet, this, this disease that is ravaging his body, continues to ravage his body. And he goes, I don't really have anything anymore except for my family and my life, but I want you to know that I love my life. Honestly, that convicted me. I think about my life, and as you would think Christians would be exempt from worry, but yet many of us were so stressed out, were so worried 
if I don't watch it, I can fall into that category like, like you know. Um, I can have meltdown. Has anybody had like meltdown moments when it comes to anxiety recently? Raise your hand and be honest with me. Good. Few of us. Thank you. I feel better. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 is a weird verse of scripture to find a lot of awesomeness, especially for what we're going through. But this is what it says. Moses is going to make this statement. He says this in verse 19, and I think if you get nothing out of the message, get this. Here's what he said to the children of Israel. He said, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, and I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. And that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. How do you be blessed in this life? Moses challenged Israel to choose life, to obey God. Basically, we understand that God doesn't force his will on anybody. We have to decide to, to follow or reject. It's a life and death matter, but we have to do it each day. We have to affirm and we have to reinforce our commitment to God. Are we going to choose life? Are we going to hold fast? Are we going to be blessed, not only for our life, but for the people around us? At the end, it's not the years of your life that count. It's the life in your years. So a couple of weeks ago, my, my friend, Pastor Dan Seaborn, spoke. And by the way, pray for Pastor Dan. Um, I don't think Dan was feeling good when he got here. Uh, he was like me, felt like he had some sinus issues. He got home and was tested positive for COVID. So um, Pastor Dan, I'm not saying anything out of turn because he's put that out on his social media stuff to pray for him. He had a really good thought on his winning at home site on Facebook about how to, to look at Thanksgiving because his Thanksgiving, like many of our Thanksgiving, Thanksgivings were different. Didn't get a chance to spend with his family. But I was so grateful for Pastor Dan to come and speak in this Domino Effect series. His message, it still resonates with me even today. I think about this a lot. Obviously, he's poured a lot of this into me as we talk back and forth every week, that, that idea. And I preached on it. Um, didn't necessarily preach on it because he and I were talking about it, but we kind of ended up together with that idea of Jesus is the way, the life, and the truth. And I got a chance to speak at, at it through Thomas's point of view. And Dan was just talking about, hey, how do we navigate um, our way through this season? Jesus is the way. And I loved that message. So insightful. So the song that we just sang a while ago, Slip On By, was from a, uh, a Christian band called Finding Favor. It's a new song. The lead singer would say that he spent some time with his grandfather, his grandfather who had lost his wife at a young age, his grandfather who had lost his son, this man's dad, to a war. So the grandson took the grandfather fishing one day, and the, and the grandson said, man, my grandfather was upset. We didn't have a great time at our favorite fishing hole. Grandpa just kind of lost, lost it emotionally and kept talking about, man, I would give anything to kiss my wife one more time. His wife died at 53 years old. I would give anything to hug my son one more time, who he died in a war. And he looked at his grandson, who is now married, and he said, son, man, you need to go home. You need to hug your wife. You need to hug your family. Don't let this world just slip on Bye. So Joel, on staff, um, up, there, up there in the sound booth, he found this song. He sent it to me. It was a song that was originally slated for this series. And we were going to talk about time, and we had it there, and it affected me. I began to listen to this song, and some of you know that, you know, I'm in an age to where um, it's kind of winding down for me to be a parent. My son, my son is a junior. Um, I've got just a couple more years with him at home. My daughter is pregnant. She's going to have her little baby girl here in the end of January and February. So Papa will be, uh, I'm sure, called on to babysit a lot, which I'm grateful. If not, I'll be a basket case. I need some goodness in 2021. Anybody else? I'm ready. I'll be grandpa in spades. 
So here's what I, I thought about. And my son's in the room and he was running camera. I want Mason to come out with me because Mason, something, something happened to me a couple of weeks ago that's going to stay with me for a while. And it started with him. Mason is young and fit, good looking. I mean, I look in the mirror, I see myself. <laughs> Long time ago. So that song, Slip On By, stayed with me. Mason is a junior in high school. He just got done with football. See, uh, football I had, a, had a good season over with the Smoky Bears. He's getting ready to jump into baseball. Mason, he lives life. This boy goes Mach 2 with his hair on fire. And so for me, um, I've been busy trying to navigate the world and the church. And Mason and I, I'm, I feel like I'm a good dad. I see him all the time. But yet I just felt like, you know what? I don't want too much more time to slip on by without spending some time with my son. I don't want to gain the whole world and lose this moment that I have. And so I wanted to spend time with Mason, um, barring any outside influences, i.e. his girlfriend. Because she's joined at the hip right here. I wanted just Mason and I. So we went out. Um, some of you saw the video last week. We flew to Southern Colorado, what he and I love to do. I taught him, and uh, he is awesome. He's taking it to another level. We love to snow ski. That's the air that we breathe. We, we love it. And we had a little bit of a window where Pastor Dan was preaching. Mason was out of school. It was Veterans Day. Football was over. He couldn't even go to the indoor to practice baseball. And I'm like, Mason, are your grades okay? He's like, ah. I'm like, well, good. I'm going to take you out of school for a day or two, and we're going to go out. Colorado and we're going to ski. We found snow. We flew into Durango. We'd never been there. A little one room hut. The airport was tiny. Literally, it was funny. If you wanted to get a snack, you actually walked into a tent. It's pretty. If you never flew into Durango, do it. It's, it's like this big. We drove to Pagosa Springs. We saw elk and deer. We had a great time, just Mason and I. I think I was getting COVID at the time. I was feeling a little bad, but Mason's like, suck it up, buttercup. Let's go. Whatever. So we would stay in Pagosa Springs and we would drive up to Wolf Creek Ski Area. It wasn't really a resort, it's just a, uh, it's like, if you've ever driven to Beckley, West Virginia, and you've seen Winter Place Ski Resort there on the interstate, this is like Beckley on steroids or Winter Place on steroids, Wolf Creek, never been there. We went up there and nothing was open because of COVID, only the lifts and the restrooms. We had to pack our stuff in every day. We had to stop at the grocery store, fill up our backpacks. We would go there, either sit in your car. We found a little picnic area, and we would just have to open our backpacks up and have a little picnic, but nothing was open. There was very few people there. Um, of course, what does Mason get at the grocery store? Salad. So how do you eat? Anyway, um, so Mason and I, long story short, let's bring you back to this moment, a place called Knife Ridge. I personally do not like to hike with ski boots on, I like to ski downhill. I'm 50. So I go to the top of the chairlift. I get off and ski downhill. Well, here, you got to the top of the chairlift. We had to click our skis off, Mason, your snowboard, and we had to hike up to Knife Ridge, and we had to hike this ridge. And I, we were at 11,500 feet. Look at that, y'all. Social distancing at its finest. It's just Mason and I, literally not one person. We saw no one up there. I'm scared to death. I have my snow boots on, and I'm walking like this. I've got my poles. He's got his snowboard and my skis. He's like, Dad, come on, look around. This is awesome. And what am I doing? I'm scared to death. Shut up. Just, I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. I'm walking. I'm fearful. It's that one step at a time. So Mason, right, I mean, we had to walk this ridge all the way over to here. Mason encouraged me all the way. Dad, look around. This is awesome. Mason, shut up. We're going to fall. Dad, it's okay. I got it all. You're good. Come on. I'm, I'm yeah. throwing myself under the bus hard here. I'm like, I, I've got this. Dad, look around. It took somebody, it took the sun to bring a lot of confidence in me. Now, the rest of the story, we get all the way over to this area where I thought we were out of bounds. By the way, it snowed 40 inches three days before we got there, so we're skiing up to snow up to our waist just about. I click on my skis, and I'm thinking, where do we go? And there was the only way that we could figure out was just straight down a mountain through the trees in 40 inches of powder. Mason clicks his board on. Come on, let's go. And he will say, I almost had a meltdown moment. He's like, Dad's going to melt down here. I'm going to go over the edge. 
And I'm like, Mason, I don't know, man. I don't know. He's the one at 17 years old that encouraged me, said, Dad, keep moving. Dad, you can do it. Dad, you got this. And because of his confidence in his dad, man, we did it. We got to the bottom, and we've talked about it every day ever since, that this moment will be a moment that I'll remember because my mind, I flash back when he was five, and I taught him how to ski with a hula hoop at Ober Gatlinburg. And Mason was doing the little snow plow thing, and I'm back there, and he's crying. His sister, man, learned a lot better than he did. She wasn't a wuss. He was. And yet all these years later, Somebody that, you know, hey, Dad, look around. Dad, pay attention to where we're at. Dad, don't lose this moment. Dad, this is why we came out here. Lift up your eyes. Why are you so scared? You're okay. I got you. Take one step and put it in front of the other and keep moving. And I thought about, wow, think about the world in which we live and that spiritual analogy. And I started to think about this song, and that's why we sang it last Wednesday, and we sang it a while ago, and it got us, it stuck in my mind after that moment, and I, and I began to listen to it as we skied that last two days, and just thinking about the cross is all the confidence that I need. You know, and I'm so thankful that the Son, Jesus Christ, God's Son, didn't give up on me. And sometimes when I keep my eyes on the Son, you, you know what, I find myself in places that I'm so thankful to be. And many of us, we've taken our focus off the sun. We've taken our focus off the sun, and you're just like me. All of us are navigating Knife Ridge, and we're scared to death. We don't know if we're going to fall. We're waiting for the other shoe to drop. And honestly, he'll tell you, and I'm, I'm being very candid, that's exactly where I was at that moment. I mean, to the point where he was, Dad, look around. It's okay. We, we got this together. I get to a place where I'm going to ski, Mason, I don't know, because if I fall in this snow, I'll never be seen again. (laughs) Dad, we got this. And it's crazy to think about me at 50, the world that I've navigated, the things that I've seen, all my experience. Um, The older you get, the more experience you have, but sometimes it's the young person of faith. It's the young people, not just when it comes to our physical age, but our spiritual age, the people that walk by faith that can really make the difference. And Mason's confidence in me made the difference and my confidence in the cross, even as I walk through this last two weeks of COVID has made the difference. If you ask my mom at 78 years old and she got knocked to the floor, uh, bottom line people, her confidence in the cross and her faith made the difference. Mom will tell you, she'll take nothing back. She'll like, well, maybe we should have done this or that or different. You realize how many people have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, how we've navigated the world since May and coming back to church over these last few months. I'll take nothing back. I'm so grateful. And guys, we got to allow this weekend, this moment, this season to be a blip on the radar. We got greater days ahead. The cross is all the confidence we need. Are we going to accept darkness or are we going to reflect light? What's it going to be? Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity. I'm so grateful for my church. I'm grateful for my church family. I'm grateful for these moments, all of us together. I pray that we're challenged in this season that we live in, not to, not just to be people that are going to just accept darkness, but may we reject darkness. May we reflect the light of Jesus Christ. May the confidence of the cross of Jesus Christ see us through. May we look to you and live for you. Thank you for the Son. Thank you for our Lord. Thank you for our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to do me a favor, everybody, even at home. I'm gonna give you a moment. If you're like Brent, this message is for me, the idea of valuing time, rejecting darkness, reflecting light. I'm gonna ask you a question. Where are you when it comes to that? Where are you when it comes to that? Maybe just right now, In this moment, you need to stand to your feet and say, God, I want to walk out these doors. I want to walk out of this service different. I want to 
to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. The cross is all the confidence I need. I'm tired of accepting darkness. I'm living in discouragement. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Allow my faith to begin to rise up as I walk into the Christmas season and allow me to reject darkness right here and right now. I don't wanna be a person that's discouraged, a person that's all about despair, a person that's all about all things bad, but God, allow us to reflect the light of Jesus Christ in our lives, in our children's lives. Allow us to choose life, allow us to hold fast, allow us to be blessed. If that's you and you know that's where you are mentally, that's where you are in your heart, hey Brent, I need this moment to say, God, I reject darkness and I wanna reflect the light of Christ more today than I did yesterday. I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to have a moment. I have a moment to put some action to your faith. God, you see us standing you see many people at home, they might not be standing, but they're standing in their hearts and their minds. God, allow this moment to, to rise up in our church. Let us remember moments like today. Remember moments that we can say, we want to reject darkness and reflect light. We don't want to accept darkness. We want to reject it, and we want to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the cross is the confidence that we need to live our life every single day person of faith because we're not guaranteed another moment. God, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.